we wait for others to join, can you let me know in the chat box what you think makes an effective presentation? Three things that you think make good presentations, presentations you enjoy listening to, or things that you think make terrible. <laughs> let me know in the chat box. Oh, when someone's just reading from a list of slides, that's always a, like a little, like a yeah. list, and I'm just reading it out. That's always, um, yeah. I just think, why, why have you come to talk to us? You can yeah. send to us a written document. I could have read it myself. And also, when they read from the slides, I can read quicker than they yeah. read out loud. So I'm not listening to them anyway. Absolutely engaging, interactive. Yeah, interesting content. Humor. Yeah, when it's appropriate, mm. done well. Absolutely. Humor is really good. Yeah, storytelling. Brilliant. Wow, perfect. Look at all of this. Great. Yes. Charismatic. Absolutely, Abby. I agree. You need both charisma and passion. There's nothing worse than listening to someone who is clearly bored by their topic. How can I be interested in what you're talking about if you're not interested in it yourself? Yeah, warm and engaging. Wow. Perfect. Well, it's just gone half past. Um, so while this is still coming in, I will get us started. Uh, thank you very much to everyone who's joined. My name is Anna and I'm part of the team here at the Oxford College of Marketing. Um, please just note that the webinar is being recorded. That's so we can then send it out to you afterwards and you can watch it back. Um, but we can't see your faces. It's all completely private. You'll just see the slides in our faces. Um, so today we've got a really exciting webinar on how to present with confidence hosted by Katerina. Um, Katerina has worked in strategic comms campaigns, press offices and events. And she also is currently teaching political master students at UCL in London. Um, so I think she's really qualified for today's talk. And she's already got us engaged in the chat. So that's definitely a good sign. Um, well, so I'll, so I'll hand over to you now, Katerina. Brilliant. Thank you so much for the introduction. Thank you so much for joining me this lunchtime. Uh, so yes, uh, I think you gave a good summary of who I am. Uh, uh, I have worked for 15 years within government, working within communications. I spend a lot of time presenting and coaching others who need to present. Um, so hopefully I've got some helpful hints and tips for you as we go as we go along. Do keep using the chat box as well. I'll keep it open throughout the session. So any questions you've got, you can post them in there already. Um, I will see them. It's quite nice to take questions as we go through as well as um, we'll obviously leave some time at the end for that too. Fab. So what are we talking about uh, today? We'll talk about objective. Really important to know what it is you want to achieve. We'll talk about audience-centered communications and presentations, um, content, being on stage, your slides and questions. What was it like working with Parky? Do you know what? It was brilliant. He was fantastic. I worked so much with government ministers who, yeah, they're brilliant, they're exciting, um, sometimes they're difficult, of course, but working with a celebrity it really, he knew how much we were adding to him and helping him and he was just very very grateful in a way that I probably wasn't used to other people being that I worked with before so no he was really really lovely I really enjoyed working with him um good question <laughs> um so let's start with objective as with everything in communications you are just going to waste your time and your audience's time if you don't have a clear objective, if you don't know what it is you hope to achieve. And it shouldn't be I was asked to speak. <laughs> Why are you doing it? Why have you agreed to attend this meeting, this conference? Why are you speaking? Do you hope to persuade or influence your audience? Do you want them to take some action? Do you want to inform an audience, but go beyond that. What do you hope to achieve when they're better informed? What would the benefit be? What would the outcome be if they've got this sort of information? So as with everything, we always need to start with objective. Be really, really clear from that um, before you get started. 
And once you've thought about that, you need to think about your audience. All communicating is more about the audience than it is about the person communicating. It's not what we say, it's what the audience hears, what they remember, what their takeaways are, whether they take the action we want them to take if there's a call to action. And so we always need to adapt our communications to suit the audience. We often have to step out of our own comfort zones and communicate in a different style in order to achieve those objectives. So always put the audience first. Who are they? How much knowledge do they have? What things might they be interested in? What length works for them? What, you know, what, what language, of course, is so important as well. You know, really think about your audience, do a bit of research into that. There are lots of barriers to communications. Let me know in the chat box what you think some of the barriers might be. So even today, while I'm speaking to you this afternoon, what sort of barriers might there be? What sort of things come between you and the message that I'm trying to deliver? Or let's say you've been sent a document to read. We all have filters that affect how much we understand. So I think I've said everything that I want to say by the end of today, but you won't remember everything, will you? Why might you not remember things? What sort of things? What's going on in the environment you're in right now? Yeah, being distracted, exactly. Um, emails are coming in. How many of you are sitting at a beautifully clear desk with a nice lamp and a plant and peace and quiet, no emails coming in? Of course not. Yeah, we only remember what's relevant, absolutely. Time and culture. Of course, we've all got our own backgrounds, our own experiences, and those impact what we remember. Tired, exactly. Hungry. It's lunchtime, isn't it? I hope you've all got something good to eat at the moment. There's all sorts of interference that comes in between us and the message. Yeah, lack of interest. Absolutely. The quality of the communications, of course, as well. Yeah, messages coming in. Native language, absolutely, all these sorts of things, pre-assumptions. So when we communicate, this is important for all communications, of course, not just presenting, we need to try to overcome some of those barriers. Yes, jargon. Jargon is something that really does drive me crazy, and I think most people as well. I think people think it make them, makes them sound clever or knowledgeable. But actually, it doesn't. It's quite irritating. So it doesn't make me think highly of the speaker. And Einstein said, if you can't explain something simply, you don't understand it well enough. So I always think of that. You need to use language that people understand. Oh, <laughs> the doorbell just went. Exactly. All sorts of distractions, aren't there? Uh, so we need to overcome those. And that's why we need to focus on the audience. We need to think about the audience. What can we do to overcome as many of those barriers as possible? So think to yourself, who's the presentation for? What do they already know that helps you decide what you're going to include or what you might still need to explain to them to make sure it's clear? What are their expectations? What have they come for? What are they interested in? What are they, what do they want to take away from it as well? You need to think about that as well as what you hope, the message you hope to deliver. Accessibility needs, um, of course, think about that. That might impact, certainly with slides and that sort of thing, I might, you know, that might impact the way we present. What's their style? What would therefore be appropriate? So I'm making conscious decisions about the tone that I use, the way that I like to present. I try to do it in a very friendly manner. I like to talk with you, not at you. I could equally take quite a stern lecturer approach to this. It would still be entirely appropriate. It wouldn't be very authentic to me. I don't think it's very good for learning either. I don't think it's very engaging. But it might be that that would suit a certain stakeholder. So what's their style? How can we adapt to suit their style? Is this stakeholder quite a visual person? Are they time poor? Do they like lots of detail? 
everyone's different. So how can you adapt to suit them? And of course, think to yourself, what questions are going to come up? What are they interested in? And we need to do all that research before we think about the content, before we stand up to speak. Once we've done that, we can think about what we want to talk about. It's really important to have a clear take home message that you hope to deliver. Don't have five or six things you want people to remember. Have one simple thing that you want to get across. And this is where that audience insight comes in again as well. You know, how much technical information do you need? How can you structure your presentation in order to help achieve that objective? What structure would be most effective? Perhaps you're trying to persuade or influence. Maybe you're trying to inform. There's different structures that work for that. Um, and what other factors might impact your presentation? And always focus on the audience's needs in order to achieve this. So what I like to do when I am working on the content for my presentation is I like to think about this house or temple model. I'm not very good at drawing on a computer, so it's quite simple. I'm quite a visual person. I find it easier to think of a core script in a visual way. So what I've got at the top is the roof of my temple. That's my one top message, my key message, my elevator pitch. One simple thing that I want to say. And everything else I say is going to support that. And it can be quite straightforward. Maybe it's a presentation about a project I'm working on to some colleagues. Maybe the simple message is the project will finish on time, but it's running over budget. Um, it could be anything, really. Maybe it's something about putting audience at the heart of everything you do. Once I've got that one simple message, I then think of, in this case, it's three columns that come underneath the simple message. It's my three supporting messages, the three key things that I want to say. And we'll talk about threes in a minute and why I go for three key messages. The last one might well be a call to action. It very often is. And underneath that, I've got all my proof points, my facts, my figures, my case studies, my anecdotes, all the things that support my messages. If you take that foundation away, the whole thing comes crumbling down. You need to have that ready. So I like to create notes that cover cover these things and that helps me work out what I'm going to include and what I'm going to leave out. So three, why do I want three key messages? What's the rule of three? And how many threes can you think of? Let me know in the chat box. Can you think of things that come in threes? Maybe campaigns, messages that you see, every day. Yeah, stop, drop, roll. What else can you think of? There's so many things that come in three. Stop, look, listen, exactly. <laughs> Triplets, yeah. <laughs> Traffic lights, get Brexit done. During the pandemic, we had hands, face, space. The tube, yeah, see it, say it, sorted. During the previous pandemic, which really doesn't feel like a pandemic anymore at all, but I worked at the Department of Health at the time. We thought everyone was going to die. It was quite, uh, it felt like a big one, but turned out later not to be. Uh, swine flu. We had catch it, bin it, kill it. Uh, yeah, stay alert, control the virus, stay alive, eat, seek, pray, intra, middle, conclusion. Exactly. The most simple and basic structure to any writing or presentation. Um, friends, Romans, countrymen. Uh, is another one. Uh, blood, sweat and tears. Uh, rise, uh, rinse, lather, repeat. Exactly. Uh, I've got a few here. Father, Son, the Holy Ghost. Um, government of the people, by the people, for the people. French Revolution, liberty, equality, fraternity. Education, education, education. Exactly, Sally. 
it has much more impact than just saying education. There's research as well into things like in writing, if you've got three bullet points, people remember that more easily than if you put two bullet points or four bullet points. It's really, really interesting when you put things in threes, the impact that it has. And the other reason why we try to stick to three key messages is that's usually how much people remember. So if you try to present them with six key messages, you've lost all control. You don't know which three they're going to remember. So as much as possible, try to stick to three clear messages. You won't always achieve it, but as much as possible, try to stick to three in your content. And again, this works for other types of communication as well, not just presentations. The other thing that we tend to talk about in presentations is this trinity of persuasion. So this comes from Cicero, and he talked about the need for ethos, logos, and pathos. And I would usually put it in that order in a presentation as well. So ethos is where you establish credibility, the credibility of the speaker. And we usually do that right up front in a presentation that usually comes in somewhere in the introduction. Um, it's where we appeal to ethics, morals, things like that, but it's really about credibility. Logos are the proof points, the facts, the figures, the evidence that we have. We need to present people with that. Why should they just believe what we say if we don't have any facts and figures to back it up? So appeal to logic. And then at the end, we try to include the pathos. This is the passion. This is about emotions. And we usually put that last because the last thing we say is the thing that people tend to remember. And this is the most persuasive if you're trying to persuade an audience to do something. So really get that passion across at the end. And I really like this quote. I think this describes it really well. People forget what you said. People forget what you did, but they will never forget how you made them feel. So if you're trying to persuade or influence, try to include that in your content. Have you covered off all these three things in your talk? If you have, you're likely to achieve your objectives. So let your passion shine through. Let that come across. Connect with your audience. That will help you achieve this as well. And be honest with the audience too. Again, that will help get all of this across. Um, yeah, yeah, this comes from... Uh, Aristotle as well. Yes, absolutely. Um, but Cic yeah, Cicero talked about it quite a lot. Um, so yeah, and uh, quite a lot of people have actually. Um, absolutely. So we talked about the beginning and the middle and the end already, didn't we? Um, so again, this is a threes, isn't it? And it's, it's the most simple structure there is. It's a simple, elegant structure. Tell people what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you've told them. I don't necessarily mean repeat exactly what you're going to say three times necessarily. I mean, yeah, education, education, education. <laughs> you've said it three times. Uh, but, you know, normally um, there's a bit more to it. But in your introduction, signpost the audience to what you're going to say. Let them know what to expect. That helps them keep track of where they are as well in the presentation. Then provide all the detail. Your logos comes in there. And at the end, again, summarize what is the main takeaway, the key point you want them to remember. So you can build that into your structure highlight anything at the end if there's a call to action something you really want them to do bring it back at the end be quite clear on it 
at the end. Length. So TED Talks are always 18 minutes long. And 18 minutes tends to be the ideal length for a presentation. I'll be honest, lots of presentations I need to give are a lot shorter or sometimes a lot longer as well. Uh, so we don't always have the control over the length. But if you can aim for 18 minutes, that's the sweet spot. It's long enough to get key points across, but not so long that people are overloaded with information and start to switch off. You generally find that an audience will have quite a lot of attention at the beginning, then it drops off, they pay less attention in the middle, and hopefully at the end you get a slight upwards turn again as well in interest. And if you go over those 18 minutes, you really need to think about how you can keep your audience engaged. There's a few things you can do. You need to wake them up again. You need to get their interest again. One thing you can do is you throw questions out at them. They can be rhetorical questions that don't require an answer. You can pick on someone quite specific. You can say, Anna, what do you think about this? Suddenly, Anna's awake again. She's paying attention. She's back in the room. And everyone else is too, because they think, oh, maybe she'll pick on me next. Uh, so that tends to wake everyone up. You can get people up, get them to move around, depending on, of course, what's appropriate for the type of presentation you're doing, where it is. You're not going to do that in a big lecture hall uh, full of 500 people. But it might be that if you've got a smaller group of people, you might be able to do something like that maybe put them into groups or get them to speak to other people. So some sort of interaction perhaps um, with other people. An anecdote, a story that helps you change your rhythm, change the way you speak. No, I just, you know, just remembered, uh, you know, and you tell a story and it just, it changes it up a little bit. It makes it more interesting. You can use videos. You can do something with your slides. You can move around a little bit as well or take the slides down for a while. Sometimes it's quite helpful to get rid of the slides for a bit, especially if you're face to face. Um, it doesn't work quite so much online, but certainly face to face, you know, maybe press the B on your keyboard. It makes your slides all go black. People tend to look at a screen. That's where the light is. They're attracted to the light. They don't tend to look at you. So if you take the slides down for a minute, Interesting enough, if you do that, they tend to still just look at the screen. So you need to move in front of the screen as well yourself um, so that they then look at you. Again, it just changes things. You need to do something to get that energy back in the room um, and help wake people up so they don't, um, they don't start to switch off and stop paying attention. So I also want to talk to you about being on stage. It can be quite daunting for a lot of people, whether you are used to doing presentations all the time, um, whether it's a new environment or whether it's something you don't do all the time at work. It can be, it can be quite daunting. It can be quite scary. So let's talk about how you can present yourself on stage, how you can deal with that, but also how you can ensure that you um, complement your presentation rather than maybe distract from it. So I'm going to play you a video. This is probably the worst speech ever. Let's have a listen and let's just think about, let me know in the chat box uh, what your reaction to this is and certain things that really stand out. So let me press play. Ladies and gentlemen, of the Star Valley Republican Party Executive Committee, thank you. Not only for your attendance, but for allowing you. Sorry, Katrina, it's a little hard for us to hear. Is it, is it not playing? Unless that's the point of it. Um, it doesn't always work um, perfectly playing it through Zoom, unfortunately. It's quite um, uh, it's staticky. Is it static? Is it yeah. not? Yeah. 
Sorry? Um, you could, um, you could, do you have a link for it on YouTube perhaps? Yeah, I'll, I'll find a link for it. Um, hold on a sec. Uh, if you just get, let me start sharing for just a second uh, so I can get you the link. Um, uh, Technical difficulties. I'll skip it. We'll have a look at it a bit later on. Um, I'll get the slides back and we'll just, um, we'll go with it. It is a bit static, to be honest, anyway. Um, but yeah, we'll skip it. I'll share it with you later and you can, you can watch it later for your own entertainment. Um, so let's talk first about dealing with nerves yeah, because that's a big thing. Yeah, we'll send it out tomorrow. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll share that link in the chat box for the video. Um, so how to deal with nerves. Prepare your presentation, practice it. Practice really does make perfect know exactly what you're going to say that way you don't have to worry about what you're going to say and you can focus more on the environment you know how you're going to present yourself on stage things like that go to the venue in advance if it's perhaps a big venue somewhere you haven't been before i mean if it's just a meeting room then that's you know you go to regularly you don't need to do that of course not but um have a look at the venue especially if you're doing a big presentation to a large audience count how many steps it is up to the stage stand there look at it walk around that way if you're nervous you can do that you know as you walk up the stage count the steps in your mind you know exactly how many steps it's going to be count how many steps it is to the podium you can do that as you walk to the podium and it helps you deal with the nerves um because it means you you focus on that rather than how nervous you are check what the blurb says what do people expect from you meet anyone else who's going to present especially anyone who's going to be there before and it's really helpful to listen if someone's giving a talk before you get there early and listen to them see how the audience reacts see what works what doesn't work uh, the context as well it might be that the other person spoke about something that you were planning on speaking about you, you need to know the context as well wear something comfortable this isn't the time for a new outfit uh, it's not the time for the big heels either uh, wear something that you feel confident in whatever the outfit is that made you feel most comfortable recently that's the best thing to wear oh we're going to come to that jane about uh, about the questions uh, absolutely and imposter syndrome i think we all get a bit of imposter syndrome Imagine what success would look like. You know, what is it? What is the reaction you want? Focus on that. Instead of your fears, focus on what it would look like. What would success look like? People looking interested, nodding along, things like that. And focus on that. Focus that in the room and breathe. Breathing really helps with the ums and the ahs as well while you're speaking. A few are absolutely fine and natural, but if you use lots of ums and ahs, it's quite distracting. And we tend to do that if we're thinking about what we want to say. So practicing in advance will stop that. And breathing in those thinking gaps, which is also really helpful for the audience. If you don't have small pauses, they're going to struggle to keep up with your message and what you're saying. And the other thing I've got in the image here, um, this, these are the Amy Cuddy power poses, which come in and out of fashion. Apparently they're back again. They've been reproven to work. So somewhere in private where nobody can see you, ideally you know, a bathroom or somewhere just completely off stage where you're not visible, stand even for just a minute or two in a powerful pose. It's sort of she had this Wonder Woman pose, um, as you can see in the, in the picture on the side and just breathe for a few minutes doing that. It tricks us into feeling we're in control. It gives us confidence. 
and it's something I've done lots of times before a job interview, things like that as well. Just obviously somewhere where people can't see you. Uh, just do this for a few minutes and it really will help you. So let's talk about the other things, the other nonverbals. The thing about presenting is we use our other forms of communication that are at our disposal, not just the words. If we're just using the words, we would send a written document. So we've got all these other forms of communication available to us, and we want to use them effectively to achieve our objective. So let's start from the top down, our face. What is your face doing? What is it saying? The woman in these pictures has got quite a lot of expression on her face. You can see what she means with some of the expressions she makes. Try filming yourself and see what your face does. Often I work with people and they touch their nose quite a lot or play with their hair or whatever it might be. And if I tell them later, they say, oh, no, I didn't do that. Well, actually, if you film yourself, you'll see that you will. And it's quite easy to concentrate on it and to stop doing it. Get rid of distractions as well. So I don't want to give anyone fashion advice, but if you play with your hair quite a lot, tie it up. Get rid of anything that causes that temptation. And this comes to clothes as well, which I know I've got at the bottom, but have you ever noticed how often uh, King Charles plays with his cufflinks? He's always doing that. If you catch yourself doing something like that, get rid of the distraction. Don't wear the cufflinks if you're tempted to play with them. Get rid of anything um, that leads to that sort of thing. You know, same with playing with pens. If you find yourself clicking a pen, it doesn't take very long for that to get really, really annoying and people stop paying attention to your presentation and what you're saying. And so don't have any pens there. Don't have anything in your pockets that might make a rattling sound or that you might be tempted to play with. Get rid of all those distractions. Eye contact is really important. We need to connect with the audience. It's that pathos side of things again, isn't it? really getting that across. And so we need to make eye contact. If you're in a really big room, I often hear people say, oh, concentrate on a spot in the background. But what does that do? You're looking above people's heads. I don't know why anyone gives that advice. It doesn't work. Instead, divide the room up into quarters, or if it's a very big room, I have to do it more than that, and just put eye contact at each of the four quarters at different times. So everyone feels that connection with you. And it's quite important to do that as well. Sometimes if you're on a big stage, there's lots of lights, you can't actually see the audience. But if you've divided it up into sections and you concentrate and looking in each section for a period of time, everyone will get that connection with you. Hand gestures. Use hand gestures effectively. Don't make them all erratic, um, smooth hand gestures that ideally support what you're saying. You might want to give the audience something. Um, you might want to make, you know, make a point. There's lots of gestures that work. Be quite mindful though about cultural differences. So I teach at University College London, at the university there, and one of the things we often do, because pointing is quite rude, sometimes people do this, don't they? That hand gesture. I had someone in my class recently who was from Ghana. It turns out that that closed fist pointing is incredibly rude. So rude that I can't say it on this webinar. It has something to do with your mother and it's probably the rudest gesture you could make in Ghana. Uh, so just be mindful of those sorts of things with hand gestures as well. How to stand. You want your feet hip width apart or ever so slightly wider than that. Not that big Tory stance uh, that we had during party conference at one point, uh, but just a little bit wider than hip width apart. The reason for that is it creates stability. You're not swaying and moving around. 
And that makes you more believable and trustworthy as well. Voice, use your voice effectively. You want to create good rhythm. Using longer sentences will slow you down. Some shorter sentences will speed you up. So try to vary the pace. Breathe. Again, you might want to record yourself to work out how you're using your voice. Now clothes. I definitely don't want to give anyone fashion advice, but there are things we can do in presentations that help and there's things that distract. So big dangly earrings can be distracting. Uh, think about the environment that you're in. What's most appropriate? What works? You know, will people be in business attire? Will they be more casual? You want to uh, you want to build rapport with the audience. If there's going to be a mic attached to you, think about what you're wearing. So I often say this to women. Uh, a lot of the the female MPs that I've worked with, you know, tell them to wear a jacket or something like that. If you don't want someone reaching down your dress to attach a microphone to your lapel, then I suggest you wear something that you could easily attach that lapel to. Uh, the microphone too, sorry, um, to have something there um, so that you don't need to do that. Generally, we advise really bold patterns. This is because it's quite distracting. People start to pay attention to what you're wearing instead of what you're saying. Uh, Theresa May gave a speech with a Frida Carlo bracelet on at one point, and everyone ended up talking about the bracelet it was quite out of character and things like that, rather than paying attention to what she was saying. Um, and yeah, go for comfort. The outfit you feel most comfortable in. Nothing new, nothing um, constrictive. Think about whether you might end up sitting or standing, that sort of thing as well. What's going to work well for you? The other thing with our nonverbals is we need to make a really good impression. You want to get some energy into the start. So when I work with people who have quite monotone voices, who struggle to get that energy across, that passion across at the beginning, I'll often tell them again, where no one can see you, <laughs> jump up and down on the spot a few times, get the blood pumping, make sure you're quite animated. You've got that upbeat start and really practice the beginning. People tend to judge us right from the start. And that's why it's really important to get that start right. So put a bit of time, put a bit of effort into it and practice it in advance. Slides, visuals, they can be fantastic, but they shouldn't take center stage. Slides need to complement what you're saying, not take over. And I'll go through some examples of some bad slides in a moment. Don't use them as notes. Someone right at the beginning said one of the worst sort of presentations is when someone just reads out from the slides. Sometimes they even turn and they're looking like that and they read out from the slides. I think, what? why have you come? Why have you turned up? And also if they do that, and actually even if they're reading off notes that they've got in front of them, if they don't look up and make that eye contact, you're giving people permission to look away. You're giving them permission to look at their emails or their phones or do something else other than listen to you. And really it's a presentation. There's something you hope to achieve from a presentation, which is why you're doing it in this format, using this channel instead of sending a document. So don't read anything out. Make sure they're engaging. Again, it's a good chance to get people interested. If you put a fun slide, maybe something with humor on in the middle to just make it that little bit more interesting. And I'll share in the chat box later as well, a link to a death by PowerPoint uh, talk that I find quite interesting, a TED talk. So there is, um, we often talk about the 10, 20, 30 rule with slides. So your slides, you shouldn't have more than 10 slides, ideally. 
this is face to face. Online, I would use more slides because it's easier to get distracted. It's easier for people to lose that concentration. So changing the slides and waking them up again is really helpful. But face to face, you want 10 slides. You want a presentation that lasts no more than 20 minutes. Um, and you want a font size of no less than 30 points. So that's the 10, 20, 30 rule. It'll be slightly different online. People are closer to a screen, so you can have a smaller font, but you need a bigger paragraph uh, spacing. Face to face, you need to think about the person at the back of the room. Can they read it or not? That's why we need the large font. So this is an example of an absolutely terrible slide. It's really, really hard to read. You've got a distracting background. You've got different fonts. You've got different colors. You've got pictures that aren't helpful whatsoever. It is full of spelling mistakes. There is far too much text here. Um, this is probably one of the worst slides I could think of. And it's got fonts and paragraphs that go off, uh, off the side as well. And again, if you're doing something online, you need to think about that because people might be viewing your slides on different devices. So think about having a border to make sure that doesn't happen. It's different face to face because you can see what people see, but you don't see what they see um, if they're on different, different devices. So strike that good balance between the text and the images. Think about the font and charts, which I'm gonna show you in a minute. Those helpful images builds, just when you show a slide and then you keep showing the slide, but with an extra addition to it. Um, and just think about accessibility as well. Just be really mindful around accessibility. Uh, so too much text, if there's someone who's dyslexic in the room, that sort of thing. So this is an example of a bad slide. There's far too much text. It's hard to read. And also you start to read it instead of pay attention to what I'm saying. I've taken the same information and I've broken it down. Um, so it's more engaging. Um, there's less text, it's more visual as well. Text that goes along the slide is quite difficult to read. It's easier if you break it up into columns. And I've got examples um, of the different paragraph spacing as well. You want a larger paragraph spacing if you're doing something online. Charts. This looks okay, doesn't it? Still just quite a lot going on. Make it clearer. So last thing we're going to talk about is questions before I move over to questions from you. So why do people ask questions? Why do you think, why do you ask questions? So, I mean, Jane, you're, you're concerned about going blank, perhaps. You know, if you get asked a question, you don't know the answer. But why do people ask you questions? Why, why do you do? Why do you ask questions? To uh, get more confirmation. Oh, <laughs> the exact same word. Yeah, to get confirmation on something you're not entirely sure about. Exactly. Interested. Check understanding. Clarification. The audience is very rarely out to get you. Um, they're usually on your side, and it usually means they're really interested in something you talked about. So don't be afraid of the questions. So I think the three reasons why people ask questions, and the, the main reason is the first one. They genuinely want to know the answer. They want that clarification. They want to check understanding. Sometimes you get people that want to demonstrate their own expertise. <laughs> Let them do it. <laughs> they don't really want a response. And very, very rarely you get someone who's trying to undermine you, but that doesn't happen very often. Um, it's usually the first reason. So just remember that when you've got that imposter syndrome. So be prepared. Think about questions that are going to come up. Arthur Ashe, the, uh, the American tennis player, said one important key to success is self-confidence. An important key to self-confidence is preparation. So think about the questions, prepare, and then this is much less likely to come up. So how do you deal with difficult questions? There are a few techniques that you can use. 
Um, there's bridging, which is a technique we use in media interviews. Think of two islands, your island, which is the thing you want to talk about. It's a nice, lovely, safe island. There's a hostile environment, which is the difficult question. You, as you, when someone asks you a question, they take you to their difficult island, the hostile island. You address the question, but you try to spend as little time as possible on it and then create a bridge back to the thing you want to talk about, come back to your main point. Um, so someone asks you a question about, I don't know, um, whether electric cars are good or not, and that wasn't really the thing you're there to talk about, and say, well, you know, that's, that's not for me. You know, that's not really a question for me. That's above my pay grade. But what I can say is the cost of petrol is far too expensive and you get back to the thing you're there to talk about. Um, oh, I thought I had one more slide before that. Sorry, I don't. Um, so other things you can do. Uh, make sure you take a break. Give yourself thinking space by perhaps clarifying the question with the person, getting them to clarify a certain section. Take a sip of water not the longest sip of water known to man, but a short sip of water to buy you some thinking space. Uh, if a question is too complex, you don't have to deal with all elements, perhaps deal with one element of it, the one that you want to address, and say, if there's time, we'll come back to the other things later, or, you know, happy to speak to you later. I, I want to give other people a chance to answer questions, so I'm going to address this one part. You can throw it out to the audience, of course, as well. That's not a good one for if you don't know the answer, when you don't know the answer. Um, throw out to your hands. Does anyone, what are other people's opinions on this? What do you think about this? Once other people have contributed, summarize so you regain control and add something at that point. Uh, maybe something's outside your area of expertise. Say that. You know, this this isn't my area of expertise. You know that is for so and so to answer. I'll you know, take their take the person's contact details. Make sure you'll get back to them. That sort of thing. Show the audience you're learning. Presentations is about two way conversations, so it is about so you know that's an interesting point. I hadn't thought of that. I'd really like to go away and do some more work on that. Or can we you know can we have a talk about that? I think that's really interesting. I'm glad you raised that. You know, thanks for drawing my attention to it. Um, absolutely, let's let's do some more work on that. Um, you can't know the answer to everything. And if you should know the answer and you haven't re remembered it, say if you'll get back to them, take their contact details, find a way to, to reach them afterwards um, and let them know when you can get back to them. So what makes a good presentation? We talked about that at the beginning. I think it's engaging content, a confident delivery, and the right information for the audience. So know who's in the room and make sure your presentation is the right length. And all that, I'm gonna hand over for questions. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you very much, Katrina. Just while we wait to see our questions come into the chat, um, I have one. Yes. Um, what would you say are kind of the main differences between presenting in person, like in a meeting room, yeah. versus presenting exactly like we've done today on Zoom or Teams or something like that? Absolutely, there's definitely differences. I think one of the key things is you you don't get feedback. And a lot of people say to me, oh, people don't turn on their cameras. Well, it's not really about you, it's about the audience. It doesn't matter if they turn their cameras on. And actually, it can be quite distracting. You need to make eye contact. You need to look in the camera. And if you're looking at them, their picture, then you're not engaging with them. You're not making eye contact. It's much easier for people to switch off online. They've got other things. They've got emails, stuff like that. When you're in a room, you usually, well, sometimes you've got your laptop there, but you're much more in the room. So people are more likely to switch off and the concentration levels are lower. So you usually want to make your talk even shorter. As I said, you want more slides. We're face to face. I want less slides because you're trying to wake people up. You're trying to engage them. So it's really about keeping that engagement throughout. I think the I said that you know, you've got a lot of interest at the beginning. It drops down and then it might pick up at the end. I think it drops down quicker online. Uh, so really trying to engage with them and trying to engage through the screen. 
um, is a tricky thing to do. So yeah, those are some of the things. Perfect, thank you. Um, I can see we've got a few questions coming into the chat, um, which is great. You can also put them into the Q&A box, um, either as fine, we will get to them uh, either way. Um, so oh, we yeah. have... Yeah, you Carry on. Shall I? <laughs> Sorry. Um, we've got a question, um, and I noticed this as well, and I was really impressed. Um, we found um, that you really rarely used a filler word such as um yeah. or uh, um, and uh, sorry, I'm not entirely sure how to pronounce your name, but BB wanted to know whether that's down to practice, uh, how you've accomplished that, because I noticed that as well. It's a bit of both. So I do presentations all day every day in my job so it is practice it's a lot about breathing as well and a few of them are absolutely fine it's natural so don't worry if you do a few it's just if there's lots of them it's quite distracting so practice practice what you're going to say if I've got a difficult presentation or I don't feel as confident on the topic then I will practice the whole presentation. I'll just, I'll say it out loud to the room before I'm going to do it. And I breathe. I try to take gaps and not fill them. No, thank you. I've been really impressed by that. It's really rare to hear someone do that. I think it's really <laughs> only radio hosts I hear do, doing that <laughs> no, regularly. So I haven't thought of. <laughs> very impressed it's I think it's just being mindful isn't it about what you say and being self-aware um there we go said um really hard to avoid we have another question from Manon um what can you do if you ask for ideas or you ask the audience a question and you don't get any how do you break that awkwardness absolutely so online the gap is often longer this is again something about doing online presentations and I actually count in my head to 10 to wait for comments to come in, especially if someone's typing or they're gonna to wait to see who else is gonna unmute themselves first. So you do need to build a little bit of time in. You can make eye contact, you can ask specific people. So I might say there might be someone in the in the group, and I think, what about you? You know, Udo, what about you? <laughs> Sorry, I saw your name come up there, Udo, in the chat box. Uh, you know, I'll pick on someone. What do you think? I'll try to connect with the audience as well. That will make them want to, to feed back. And if another reason they might not feed back is because they're not quite clear what you mean. So I might clarify. I might make a joke, something like that. But just the main thing is creating that connection again with the audience. Um, to get them but most people want to and most people are there to support you most people want to help you when you're presenting they don't want to make it difficult for you so there's usually someone in the room who will say something if it's gone silent mm. and that hopefully starts a, a flow of some other questions as well once there's one it's easier to ask one yourself yeah great thank you um a question from kirsten um asking for some techniques to deal with situations uh not to get flustered when things don't go to plan absolutely it happens to all of us it absolutely happens to all of us i think one thing for me is preparing in advance making sure i know what i want to say but i'm not completely wedded to it i can go into different directions I can switch things up. If you see people looking bored, looking at the clock, not engaging, there is something you need to do to deal with that. And so I think it's about being flexible about your content. I often have a few extra things that I could talk about. I might change my tone. I might try to add an anecdote or something like that. And again, it might be about interest. It might be about creating a connection, just seeing, you know, is this content right for this audience? Maybe I've maybe I've misjudged it. So the ability to do that, uh, this happened to me a couple of weeks ago, actually. I, I was doing the same presentation. I'd done it three times and it was brilliant. And the fourth time, the last time I did it, the point at which I should be most confident, it just it wasn't working. So I needed to change tact. And I, I talked about some other things I took a bit of feedback from the audience just by looking at their body language and how they reacted, what things were more engaging for them. And so I switched and I 
spent more time talking about the things that they were interested in. Perfect, thank you. That's really good advice. Um, Jab Yulani asked um, if we can go back to the first slides. Um, Jab, these will be sent out to you. Um, the slides will be sent out to you over email, so um, you'll get those tomorrow. Um, but he also wanted to know, Katrina, what your thoughts are on strategic courses. So strategic courses. Sorry, strategic pauses. Oh, pauses. Oh, sorry, I misheard. Of no, that was my mispronunciation. <laughs> yeah, I think strategic pauses are good. I definitely do them, and I think if you don't pause at any point, the audience can't follow what you're saying. And really early on in my career, that was actually some feedback that I was given that when I present, I just go straight through it. You know, high speed without stopping in between. So yes, I really like strategic pauses. Let the audience absorb the information. Don't overload them. That's really good advice. Thank you. I I noticed you doing that as well. And it definitely gave me more of a chance just to take in the information. Um, and that's not something that we always have in these webinars, but um, I thought that was, yeah, particularly good um, today. Um, Caitlin had a question. Um, do you have any tips for people who are particularly nervous presenting even to small group? Yeah, uh, I mean, practice is the answer to all these things. And try to make as many unknowns knowns. That's why I said you go to the venue, count how many steps, things like that, just to help you also give something else to concentrate on. So find other things that you can focus on to get rid of the nerves before you start speaking. Find someone familiar who might be able to come along, I mean, as long as it's appropriate. If you've got someone friendly at work, a colleague you get on quite well with, maybe get them to come along. I think it's nice when you see a familiar face, but as much as possible, make all these unknowns knowns. That makes it much, much easier. And again, that's my practice. And I would definitely practice your whole talk, just wherever it is, at home, in the bedroom, wherever it might be. Do the whole thing out loud, just to an empty room. It makes it much, much easier. Don't memorise it, though, please, because that will cause issues as well. Be flexible with it. But that way you know exactly what you're going to say. Brilliant, thank you. Um, a question from Udo asking, uh, do you have any tips when you lose the, your train of thought? Absolutely, so I come back to the roof of my house or temple or whatever, <laughs> whatever you want to think of it. Know the one thing, the one message you want to get across. And something I do, I do a lot of media training for spokespeople. Something I do for them, which can also work for presentations is, Write that one idea down. So it's not all your key points you want to say, but write the one thing down you want to say. Put it in your pocket and take it with you. There's an act of writing it down that helps you remember it and remember to stick to that point. There's something about putting it in your pocket and bringing it with you, which again, just really makes you remember it. So if you get stuck, always come back to the main point. And then you find you get back on track again. Brilliant, thank you. Um, a question uh, from Jane, and I've seen it um, come out a couple of times actually. Um, how do you slow yourself down if you're feeling nervous and speaking quickly? Like, how do you actually <laughs> start talking at a more uh, normal rate? So if I realize I'm doing that, and I definitely have done that in the past, breathe take a moment or take a sip of water do something just to stop yourself for a moment and then you can start again at a slower pace so a sip of water or one of those pauses just to kind of break that cycle really of rushing through it absolutely perfect thank you um i don't think we have any other questions um that have come up um, I'll just give a little moment or two in case any more do, uh, but that was fantastic. Thank you very much, Katerina. Um, I really enjoyed that. Thank you. I've also put three things in the chat box for you. The Death by PowerPoint TED Talk, which I really like. Uh, I do recommend watching that. 
Uh, the Seven Principles of Persuasion by Cialdini, uh, they are fantastic. Uh, and again, something to think about incorporating into your content. And that worst speech ever is absolutely terrible. And it's quite, it's funny to watch. Uh, so those are in the chat box for you as well. Brilliant, thank you. Um, i just have a look. Um, so that concludes our webinar today. Thank you very much for attending. I hope you all enjoyed it and found it as useful as I did. Um, we will be sending out the recording of this webinar to you tomorrow, as well as a slide deck so you can catch up on anything you missed. Um, I'm also going to put our inquiries email um, and a link to some of our short marketing courses in the chat in case anyone is interested. Um, we do also offer uh, PR courses, so public relations courses from the Chartered Institute of PR. Um, so if anyone is interested in kind of expanding on the knowledge that they've learned today, please do get in touch. We'll be more than happy to help you. Um, other than that, thank you very much, Katrina, for presenting. Thank you to everyone who has attended. And I hope you all have a lovely afternoon. Thank you. Enjoy your afternoon. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.